Joining me once again, and it's been a few weeks since he was on the channel, is our good friend, Kevin Hoser Miller. As you guys remember, Hoser and I served together in CAG 7 in the early 90s. Hoser was CAG Paddles. I was a Cat 2 Rio and VF 143 aboard Eisenhower. And as you guys also remember, Kevin is a noted author. And among his body of work is this work of historical fiction called The Silver Waterfall, which is a novel about the Battle of Midway. So I thought here on the 80th anniversary of this famous battle, this legendary battle, who better to describe it to us than Hoser? Hoser, welcome back to the channel. Hi, Moots. Great to be with you. So let's start setting the scene with Pearl Harbor. The Japanese Navy attacks Pearl Harbor and the carriers aren't there. So that proves to be a fortuitous eventuality as the war goes forward. So we enter the war, a day which will live in infamy. What people maybe forget is a mere six months after Pearl Harbor, we get involved in this legendary battle in early June. So set it up for us. Admiral Isoruku Yamamoto said that uh, given war with the United States and Great Britain, he would run wild for the first six months and win victory after victory. But after that, he had no guarantee of success. And, uh, and yes, Japan did run wild. And, and within hours of Pearl Harbor, they attacked our forces on the Philippines. They attacked the Dutch East Indies. Uh, they attacked Singapore. Uh, they sank the British battleships Repulse and Prince of Wales. They attacked Rabaul. Um, uh, Darwin, Australia, and, and took their, uh, their, their task force, uh, four of their Pearl Harbor carriers, into the Indian Ocean, sank a British carrier, and, uh, and beat up their naval base at Trincomalee. So Japan is on the march in, the, in just you know, weeks after the, the beginning of hostilities. Um, the United States um, had those carriers, though, as, as you said, and, and, and we had three at the outset of the Pacific War. And, uh, and, and more came over from the Atlantic fleet. Um, but in, in early February 1942, uh, you know, we sent Lexington and, uh, and Enterprise to, uh, to the Central Pacific Islands and started to, uh, to, you know, to attack Japan where we could. And, uh, and, and these raids were largely ignored by the Japanese. You know, they, they did not cause them much trouble. But on April 18th, 1942, USS Hornet, brand new ship, delivered 16 B-25 bombers that do a little raid, arguably the, the greatest aerial raid in, in, uh, in military history. And uh, this attack, of course, shocked the Japanese. I mean, we brought the war right to their capital. And uh, uh, Japan said, okay, we have to keep husband resources back in Japan to uh, defend against future attack. And less than one month later, at the Coral Sea, we met and, and thwarted a Japanese thrust to cut the sea lines of communication with Australia. And uh, we were able to, uh, to sink a Japanese light carrier, um, heavily damaged their carrier Shokaku, a Pearl Harbor raider, and uh, shot down many airplanes on, on the air group of Zuikaku, uh, so Japan could not uh, continue. Japan was able to, uh, to attack and uh, eventually sink Lexington, beat up Yorktown very badly. They sank an oiler. Uh, so a, a tactical loss, perhaps, for the United States, but a strategic win. And uh, that set the stage one month later at Midway. Japan knew that they had to do something to, uh, to put the American carriers on the bottom. So Admiral Yamamoto's plan, he'd been thinking about this, was to capture something that would make the Americans come out and fight. And he chose to capture Midway, 1,000 miles northwest of Hawaii. So we knew because we'd crack their code, that this was their plan. And so that was one bit of advantage that we had. So we send two task force out in a timely fashion. So let's talk about that. Commander Joseph Roquefort was a, a naval officer and he had a background in crypto analysis, uh, fluent in the Japanese language, as many naval officers were throughout the 1930s as we had you know, traded billets. I and mean, he had served in Japan and, and Japanese officers like Admiral Nagumo had served in the United States on, on exchange tours, if you will. 
but uh, through painstaking mathematical analysis, they had broken most of the Japanese code. And so he brought this information to Commander Edwin Layton, who was Nimitz's intel officer. And uh, they, they agreed that they're, they're going to Midway, that they could, that they could prove it. And uh, so they, they proved it to Nimitz. Now, th this, is, this is about the, uh, the April uh, time frame. And, uh, and Nimitz relays this information to Washington. And Washington said, no, 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 your guys are wrong. They're going to go to Johnston Island. They're not going to go to Midway. And, and uh, so this is the famous water ruse message that, uh, that, that some think, okay, that, that this will allow us to prove that it's, it's Midway. Uh, uh, Roquefort and Leighton and Nimitz in Hawaii knew they were going to Midway. So they sent this water ruse message. And so they basically said, okay, Midway, send in the clear that your freshwater evaporator is, is, is in op or on the fritz or words to that effect. So they sent that message in the clear. Japanese intercepted it. And uh, they were able to analyze the Japanese intercepts. And they, and they, they said, yeah, the, the freshwater condenser on Midway is not working. So we'll have to bring extra fresh water when we, uh, when we do our amphibious assault. So this information was sent back to Washington to prove to Washington what Hawaii already knew. As we said, the task force pushes out to the northwest from Pearl Harbor, and they manage to get underway in a timely fashion, and they avoid crossing paths with the Japanese task force as a result of that. And so that was a bit of luck slash skill number one in, in this battle. Yorktown limped back from the Coral Sea, and, uh, and she went into dry dock there in, in Pearl Harbor. And the dock masters uh, told Admiral Nimitz, who was expecting her hull in waders, and uh, Admiral, it's going to take us three months to make this ship ready. And Nimitz said, gentlemen, I need this ship in three days. And they turned to and, and made her ready uh, in three days. And so uh, Enterprise and Hornet had, uh, had sortied the day before, and uh, Yorktown uh, put to sea uh, one day later. It was May 28th. 1942, and she still had some dockyard workers aboard. And she made her turn in the turning basin to get out uh, through the channel and, and underway. Uh, the, the Japanese did not do this with their carrier Shokaku, which had taken several hits. And so Shokaku was, was in the yards for many months. What they could have done is they could have taken the air wing from uh, Shokaku, the air group back in the day, uh, their pilots, put them over on Zuikaku, which was intact, and they could have sent Zuikaku, but they thought, no, we, we have plenty of force we need. Uh, our, our, our four, you know, our four best carriers, not the newer ones that we sent to Coral Sea, can do the job. It was also during this time that, that Nimitz went to Admiral Layton and said, all right, you know, Layton, I've, I've asked you to be Yamamoto's alter ego. And so, so tell me where he's going to put his, his forces. We said, well, sir, the, the, they're going to attack, you know, from, from the Northwest. And, you know, we, we, we believe on, on June third, fourth, fifth. And he said, no, 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 Leighton. I, you know, I want you to tell me exactly where they're going to be. So uh, Leighton famously said, he kind of, I'm sure he swallowed and stood at attention and said, Admiral, on Thursday, June 4th, I believe we will find the Japanese from Midway 325, 175 miles at 0600 in the morning. So we have two task force, one led by Fletcher, one led by Spruance, and then airplanes on Midway. So we out, we actually with all those airplanes added together, had more firepower than the Japanese did on paper, but they were superior at war at sea. Um, and so as you've laid out, now we got a guessing game going on. Well, uh, you're right. I mean, uh, you know, our, our three carriers, uh, carrier for carrier, uh, we carried more combat aircraft than, than the Japanese did. Uh, a, a U.S. carrier... Uh, 85, 90 aircraft in a Japanese ship, just a little smaller, 70-something, uh, roughly. Um, and, and we had Midway-based air, which was a, a hodgepodge of, every, of everything from Army B-17s, B-26s, uh, the, the combat debut of the TBF Avenger, Rooster Buffalo Fighters, uh, Volte Vindicators, the SB-2U, of also flown by Marines, and SBDs, VM SB-241. Wildcat fighters also uh, they had there, and, and of course you know PBY patrol aircraft. So so yes, we uh, the United States was superior in airplanes where it counted, 
in the waters around Midway. Now, Japan had sent a, a, a carrier task force to, to beat up Dutch Harbor in the Aleutians and attack uh, and capture two islands in the Aleutians. And they thought, okay, okay, we'll do this because we know the Americans will be busy elsewhere. So while we're at it, we'll just secure our northern flank. Uh, so that whole Aleutians attack some think, well, that was a ruse to draw the American. No, no, no. They, they wanted to fight the Americans off Midway. That was absolutely their plan to, to put them on the bottom there. Armed with this information, uh, Fletcher was in overall command and, uh, and, and Spruance next to him. That they, they rendezvoused a, a few days before June 4th. On June 3rd, Ensign Jack Reed of BP-44 flying a PBY was searching southwest of Midway, about 700 miles away. And he came across the Japanese invasion force. This is the amphibious landing force. And so he, he radioed that information back. And, and Nimitz got on the radio from Hawaii and, and told his commanders, okay, that, that's, not the, uh, that's not the carrier group. The carrier group's to the northwest. You know, and, and we had identified by ship you know, what, what we were going to find there. Uh, just as an interesting aside, that night, BP-44 went back and they uh, had put torpedoes on a PBY, which was not designed to carry them, and crews not trained to deliver them. And, and at night, they found the, uh, the Japanese amphibious ships. They, uh, they found a cargo ship, and they attacked it with a torpedo. The torpedo hit the side of the ship, and it went off. And this was the, the first and only successful attack of the battle. I mean, you got to love that innovation, you know, yes. as we think about our procurement and test programs now, and just in the field, just do it. That's definitely an era gone by. And the, uh, and the next day, uh, it was Lieutenant Howard 80 flying a, a PBY in the waters northwest of Midway. And, uh, and so he, uh, he radioed back, and all this is Morse code, by the way, uh, that uh, the Japanese found 320, 180 miles at 0555 in the morning. And, uh, and, and Leighton and uh, Nimitz are, are monitoring the action in Makalapa Hill, and Nimitz turns to Leighton and says, Leighton? You were five degrees, five miles, and five minutes off. And uh, arguably, that's our, our greatest tactical intelligence success. And so they had put the ball on the tee for the, uh, the tactical aviators and, uh, and, uh, and surface warriors that were in the waters northeast of Midway. And now it was up to them. So let's talk about a few of the principals who both were lucky and skilled once they were handed uh, the advantage, uh, and I think, of course, of Wade McCluskey and some others uh, that, that jump out as particularly June 4th unfolded. Here, here was the plan. Uh, the plan was for Fletcher to use his carrier, Yorktown, to search, and then Spruance would use his two carriers to attack and followed by, by Fletcher's carrier. So, so the morning of June 4th, Fletcher, um, he just couldn't take it anymore. Uh, he just he just sent uh, a squadron of scouting aircraft, SBD Dauntlesses, uh, to search north of him. He was afraid that Japanese might you know do an end around and go to Hawaii. And Admiral Nimitz told him not to do that. He said you know he he wanted the, uh, the the Japanese to be found by search planes from Midway that they would expect to see. The Japanese would not expect to see carrier planes. When this information comes in to uh, to Fletcher and Spruance from from uh, Lieutenant 80. Uh, Bruins told, uh, um, went to his chief of staff, Miles Browning, said, launch everything you have at the earliest opportunity. So Enterprise and Hornet made ready. And about 0700, uh, the crews were, were you know, running to their aircraft. And, uh, and Enterprise and Hornet uh, got off all of their airplanes, uh, you know, almost by 8 o'clock in the morning. I think Enterprise, you know, 0755. What really happened was the launch went late. You know, things happen. Airplanes, they act up and they got to be pulled aside and they're not ready and this and that. And so the SBDs were orbiting overhead Enterprise waiting for the, 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 the TBD uh, torpedo bombers to get airborne. And Spruance said, no, you guys got to go right now. We, we just cannot delay anymore. So McCluskey took his uh, 36 dive bombers with him to the, uh, to the southwest. At the same time on Hornet, and there was no coordination between Hornet and Enterprise, you know, uh, the air group commander, Stanhope Rang, was told, okay, you, you've got your airplanes. We're not going to worry about what Enterprise is doing. So you've got your 59 airplanes that you're leading. And, uh, of course, Lieutenant Commander John Waldron was, uh, was uh, one in, in among that 59. So notably, the Japanese got their 
sorties launched in minutes. And as you mentioned, it took us over an hour to get all of the mission aircraft airborne. And as a function of that, the fighters were already low on gas, which plays out as we go forward here. Um, so as we think about cyclic ops and how quickly we will want to get a 25 plane event into the air, you know, our time frame is, you know, that should take minutes, not an hour. And so that was a sort of in the others category for the U.S. Navy uh, at, at that point. But we made up for it as this day unfolds. Some of it was skill and some of it was luck. You're right. I mean, the, the, the Japanese can, can be admired, you know, still today. Uh, their, their technique, their doctrine is, uh, all right, the first airplane just gets a signal to launch. And then the second one behind it launches, then the third, and they just go. They just, they just take interval on each other. Whereas the Americans, you know, we, we taxi in a position and they, you know, run the engine up to full power and the, 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 uh, the, the flight deck officer would be waving a flag and he would listen to the revs of the engine and he would think, okay, that's good. Or, or yeah, maybe you know, let's, let's try that again. And, and so it took time. Uh, Japan at, at dawn that morning, just as they had at Pearl Harbor, they launched over a hundred airplanes uh, led by Lieutenant Tomonaga of Hiryu. And they went to attack Midway. And the plan was to, uh, to, to neutralize Midway. And that would set the stage the following day for the invasion force to, uh, to land troops on the beach and, and, and take it. Um, they, they were uh, met by stiff American resistance, uh, American fighters flown by Marines, uh, led by uh, Major Parks in, in his Brewster Buffalo. Uh, he, he lost his life and, uh, and, and was shot down and, and, and strafed in a shoot. That's the, the brutality of, of World War II. The Americans, though, uh, did some good work uh, with their fighters and with uh, the AAA that Marines are, are firing as the Japanese attack. So the Japanese it, it lost you know, a significant number of airplanes. They really hadn't seen losses like this before. And, and this information was radioed back to Admiral Nagumo. There is a need for a second strike. And this was not part of their plan. They're, they're, okay, one strike, we're going to neutralize it like we always do. We always kick their ass. And then, uh, and then we'll be ready for anything. So, so they had airplanes in the in their hangar bays that were ready to attack ships if any showed up. But we need another restrike. So, okay, and here it comes. Let's download the ship ordnance. Let's upload general purpose bombs for land ordnance. While this is happening, and we know this takes time to download and upload, uh, they're scouting. Uh, aircraft uh, found uh, 10 American ships, a surface action group, and 10 ships. Okay, Americans are here. I mean, our, our day of glory comes sooner, but uh, okay, what, what kind of ships? Is there a carrier among them? So tell us, is there a carrier there? And uh, so that took time. And then when it was finally found out, uh, yes, there is. Okay, now, all right, guys, stop the load, download the general purpose bombs for land, upload the armor piercing bombs and, and the torpedoes for ships, and, and we're gonna attack them. They also had to recover their, their strikers, and now they're being attacked by midway aircraft that lasted for really the three hours. Um, and these are B-26s, also with torpedoes. B-26s weren't trained to carry those things. And they, they dropped torpedoes on Akagi, and, uh, and, and they missed, of course, two of the four shot down. B-17 high-level bombers, you know, the Japanese had to honor that threat. But uh, the Marine Corps dive bombers, and the Navy TVF Avengers were just savaged by the Japanese cap. So and that was the that was the first wave to reach the Japanese carriers. That's correct. It was it was the land based aircraft from Midway, uh, dozens, and and over half of them shot down. And and those that made it back to Midway were were beat up, and they're not going to fly again. That so day. you mentioned that the Japanese patrol planes found our surface action group, and as you mentioned, the question was what kind of ships and make sure I get the chronology right. At one point, I don't know which carrier it was, which of the three, but it was obscured by clouds. So that discovery wasn't made as soon as it could have been, had the weather been clear. Yes. And that was luck on our part because, because had that discovery, had us flew over a carrier that would have absolutely galvanized the Japanese. They said, okay, we have got to get that right now. And, and they may have made the decision and it, you know, history shows would have been the correct one. You know, here's the Tomonaga strike group coming back to land. And, and maybe they would have had to allow some of those airplanes to ditch because they have to make their deck ready 
to uh, to to attack the, the carrier that that was not supposed to be there, but they've got to react to it. So let's review the bidding then in terms of the two task force. As you mentioned, one sortie, one event basically flies northwest because they're afraid that they're doing a button hook or an end around trying to go to, to Hawaii and that in hindsight proves to be a bad direction to go. And the other one is heading for what they believe to be the constant bearing decreasing range intercept point as the flotilla heads for Midway. So how does this mission fare? This is uh, McCluskey and Ring are, are leading their respective air groups uh, and uh, to, to attack the, the Japanese. Um, Wade McCluskey, he gets to the end of his, his uh, search leg and all he can see underneath him is, is water and clouds. The clouds were, were broken. So, you know, you, and uh, a familiar feeling for many of us, you know, all, you know all, all I can see is water and clouds. And so you have to kind of get on top of the breaks in the broken clouds and look down there to the surface to, to see what's there. It's not like you can see ahead of you. All you can see ahead of you is a blanket of cotton. And so you've got to get right over and, and look down there. So this was obviously taking time. Wade McCluskey made a decision to continue 15 more minutes. And Nimitz called this one of the most important decisions of the war. Uh, he flies 15 more minutes up to 20,000 feet and he, he knows his guys are reaching fuel starvation. He decides to turn right, which is to the Northwest, which would parallel the reciprocal of the Japanese approach course. And he goes another 15 minutes in that direction. And now he's starting to lose airplanes. You know, the ensigns at the end of this, you know, 18 plane whip, if you will, are uh, trying to maintain position and, and really high on the fuel flow. Uh, they, they just ran out of gas and they just, they just floated to, to, to the surface and they had to ditch and, and uh, get picked up in, in rafts if they were lucky. Um, McCluskey is, is just, you know, he's got the binoculars glued to his face and uh, he says, I've, I've got to turn back. I mean, he's, He's got this an excruciating decision, and you know, and, and we face decisions similar to this. Uh, you know, okay, if I don't hit anything with my aircraft, my loaded aircraft, then the Japanese are going to find us, and they're going to hit us. But if I if I run everyone out of gas, then then we're done. We have no chance. So McCluskey decides, okay, I'll I'll, I'll go north and kind of maybe kind of circle back toward the ship just as long as I can possibly take it, and then he looks down through a break in the clouds and he sees a destroyer, Arashi. And this was a destroyer that was prosecuting the submarine Nautilus commanded by Lieutenant Commander William Brockman that had been in among the Japanese screen that morning while they were under attack. The Japanese had now moved off to the Northeast because they're gonna launch their big strike to crush the Americans. So he follows this Japanese ship and it leads him to another break in the clouds and he can now see first two and then four flight decks. At the same time, uh, Senate Commander Max Leslie from Yorktown, and he's leading his bombers from, from Yorktown. Yorktown had recovered their airplanes and they had launched his squadron. And Max Leslie thought that the scouting squadron was also gonna go with him. And at the last minute, the uh, Admiral Fletcher decided not to uh, send them. For, and so this was unknown to essentially the strike leader who thought they were there with them. But they, they came across the Japanese at exactly the same time. So what have the Japanese been doing in the previous hour? John Waldron was the first to find the Japanese, and Ensign George Gay, the sole survivor of Torpedo 8, said that Skipper Waldron took him to the Japanese like he had a string tied to him. And so now the Japanese cap is, is down on the water, and they slaughtered BT-8 just about the time that J Japan had finished recovering their last of the Tomonaga strikers. Um, 20 minutes later, BT-6, led by Lieutenant Commander Gene Lindsay from Enterprise, shows up and, and they and they, they had found uh, on the horizon smoke that had uh, you know the, the after effects of the of the smoke screen and, and anti-aircraft from the Walter attack so they go to the Japanese and now the Japanese fighters are on top of them and, and Japan is is reeling once again you know they have to maneuver their ships they're healing hard and you're trying to load a 2,000 pound torpedo and the ships in a in a, you know in a heavy heel uh, hard to do and it, and it takes time a little after 10 o'clock as the American dive bombers are showing up, BT-3, led by Lieutenant Commander Lem Massey of Yorktown, also shows up, sees the commotion on the horizon, is led there. And so the Japanese fighters throughout this time are down low and doing good work with these lumbering TBDs 
that had to had to slow from their cruising speed of 110 knots down to 80 knots at 80 feet to have a chance of delivering their torpedo against the hull of the ship. I mean, it's just just completely unfair um, that the torpedo squadrons, uh, because of their sacrifice, and, and those guys knew what they were flying. They they had no illusions. Uh, were, were able to set the stage that the Americans could come in from above unmolested. This is June 4th at 10 o'clock in the morning. Now, let, let me, I'm going to back up five minutes. So before McCluskey sees the Japanese destroyer Arashi, uh, no naval professional would give the United States any chance to win this battle now. All the airplanes from Midway, about 50 of them at least, uh, have have shot their water. They've attacked the Japanese. They have nothing to show for it, and most of them are shot down or not flyable. The torpedo squadrons from three carriers, virtually all shot down, nothing to show for it. The guys on Hornet are going the wrong way. And in fact, all of their fighters, escort fighters, ran out of gas and had to ditch. The guys on uh, on Enterprise are, are about to run out of gas, and, uh, and uh, Max Leslie from... Uh, from Yorktown, uh, you know, he can't, he can't say anything either. So, you know, th this this was a, a goat rope, to use a technical term, that uh, that we were facing at the time. Um, and, and it kind of continued. You know, this this is, these are human beings under tremendous pressure, and, and we all want the same thing. But after McCluskey finds the Japanese, now he's got Lieutenant Richard Best, who is the commander of, of Bombing 6. Now, Best had taken his men down to 15,000 feet, because one of them, Bud Crager, had, was running out of oxygen. So you get down to 15,000 feet so, so he and everyone else can breathe. So they're talking on scratchy, unreliable radios. So here's what they see. McCluskey sees side to side. Okay, here's a carrier. Here's a carrier. Best sees near, far, near, and far. And so each of them is saying, okay, we're going to attack according to doctrine. And Best thinks, okay, I'm going to attack the near carrier, which is on the left. And McCluskey says, okay, I'm going to attack the carrier on the left because Best is to my right. So they they both, and they're separated by 5,000 feet. Um, the, the technique in the, in the SBD was to descend to the low teens and then roll in. So they all do that. And then Best realizes, what the heck, what are these guys doing? They're diving on top of me. So he takes his two wingmen over to Akagi and, and saves the day. Uh, but most of the rest of his squadron continued in their dives and that's what they're trying to do. And, uh, and just covered uh, Akaga with uh, just uh, you know 25 bombs. The doctrine for the Americans is one squadron of, of SBDs to attack one carrier. So uh, that would disable the carrier and then you put it on the bottom with a torpedo bomber. So that was a doctrine. So one squadron per ship, you, you, it's kind of a mess Richard Best went over to Akagi, and, and they were able to attack it. But, uh, but, you know, McCluskey did what he was assigned to do, you know, with, with that number of aircraft to sink or disable two carriers, and he did. Well, as you said, it was a it was an audible made in the heat of battle because you have a Simo run going, and he's like, okay, he recognized it, which is fantastic, and then adjusted just in time. Because absent that, you put too much ordnance on too few ships, and uh, and you, you you don't do as much damage as you ultimately did because of the decision that he made. If I may, Mooch, I'd like to to go to the uh, to the training aid here, and Let's I do it. I have the uh, descendant of the SBD Dauntless dive bomber, this uh, this FA eighteen B here. I'd like to talk about how they they rolled in and what they would do is is they would slow to, uh, um, to uh, deploy their dive brakes about twelve to thirteen thousand feet. And the aircraft would take trail on each other. Uh, it, it wasn't a welded wing dive. I mean, it, it, these airplanes are going to roll in individually. So you would you kind of put the uh, uh, the target in that crotch between your fuselage and your and your wing line. And I, I've sat in an SBD before, so you kind of look over your, your left shoulder, and you can see that see that crotch form there. And you until you can no longer take it. And then what they would do is like we did back in the day, pull their nose across the horizon. And then stomp on bottom rudder and and roll inverted and pull down into a 90 degree dive, and that's what the the gunner would uh, would have stowed his gun and turned facing forward. And uh, the technique was that the gunner would call out altitudes in thousands of feet, eight thousand, 
7,000. And we, after four, it'd be 39, 38, 37. And the pilot is just tracking through his, uh, the crosshairs on the tube uh, above, his, uh, above his dash there. The technique was to deliver the weapon at 2,000 feet. And you're, you're in a near vertical dive. The weapon would, would come off. And then with two hands, you'd pull on the pole. And we're, we're talking six, seven, eight, and more Gs, I've read. And you pull out just above the wave top. Uh, the, the gunner would then re, you know, recover <laughs> from that pole. Without and, any G suits. With right? no G suits. With no G suits. Yeah. And, he, and he would then, you know, you know, un, swivel around facing aft and get the gun out and, and, and start firing. Um, just uh, amazing what they did. The, the, the navigation system that these guys had, again, I, I sat in the cockpit. They have a, uh, a plotting board underneath the instrument panel, uh, the good old-fashioned maneuvering board that we remember from midshipman days. They had that and, and a grease pencil. So they would say, okay, I take off from, from the middle of this maneuvering board. I'm flying 240 for this amount of time at, at this speed. They kind of estimate ground speed. They could see the, the waves on the surface, and, and they made an estimate for that. And, uh, okay, then I'm going to attack, and now I've got to find my way back to the ship. The radio and gunners, their job was to operate the radio and the gun. They did not brief with the pilots. They had their own separate ready room. So they would be there at the aircraft and the pilots would run out and the gunners would have no idea what, what's going on, where they are. They just get in and, and, uh, and, and shoot and, and operate the radio and told. That's a huge leap of faith. Yes. I mean, talk about courage. Yes. Know. Let's talk about the, the Akagi attack. So here's, uh, you know, Dick Best and kind of those, those idiots and the scouts. Um, so they, he goes over to Akagi about five miles away. Uh, Edwin Crager and Fred Weber. Ensign Fred Weber follow him. And uh, so, uh, again, he takes separation. Uh, they take separation on each other. Akagi now, uh, you, know, you know, is alerted to the Americans that are attacking Kaga. And then in Fushida's book, and he was on the bridge of Akagi, you know, as best rolls in, a lookout says, hell divers. And he says, oh, my gosh. So, uh, again, in, in the attack, they go. Edwin Krager flying the number two airplane said that when he released – Skipper Best was still ahead of him in his dive. So Best presses it. They all pull off. And, uh, and, and in, in the run, Best says, you know, he saw a, a zero, you know, taking off. And he thought, you know, hey, if I can be a real hero, I'll, in, in his words, I'll ail on around and, and shoot that guy. But, but he didn't. Um, they pull off. Now, there were three bombs delivered on Akagi. The first one, according to the ship's log and to Fushida, hit very close aboard on the port side where Akagi's island is positioned. So it hits, on, they hear, you know, whistling, they're, they're taking cover, close paint scraper on the port side, it drenches everyone in Akagi's bridge. The second one whistles in and it hits amidships. And then the third one comes in and a, a close miss to stern. Now in Fushida's book, okay, so we took a hit amidships and that should not doom us, but the airplanes, in the hangar bay, and that was a Japanese doctrine, to load and fuel in the hangar bay because they were afraid of the, the Spectre being strafed if they did that on the flight deck. So in that enclosed hangar bay, an upper and lower hangar bay is how they designed their carriers. With all of the land bombs just pushed to the side of the hangar bay and all the charged fuel hoses, the, the loaded airplanes, they start cooking off. And within minutes, Akagi is doomed. And she was also doomed by the close miss that Ensign Weber got in her stern. It didn't hit the ship, but it exploded close to her stern and it disabled the Kagi's rudder. The captain put the rudder over hard and it stayed there because of the damage that it had sustained. So by that hit alone, the, uh, uh, the, the ship was doomed. At the same time this is happening, uh, Max Leslie uh, rolls in on Soryu. Now on the way out, again, this is a goat rope. Uh, he, so he has this, this new fangled electrical arming deal. And so he says, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll flick it on. And he does that, and the bomb falls off the airplane. And, you know, I can't believe it. And you only have one bomb. And, he, and he, so he looks over at his wingman, and then the wingman bomb falls off. So he gets on the radio, which, you know, breaks radio silence. Do not use the electrical arming. You know, bomb the, I mean, arm the bombs manually. And so uh, he, uh, I think about uh, one quarter of their strength had, had already lost their weapons. So he says, I can't believe this. He rolls in and, and uh, he just strafes on the way down in his vertical dive, pulls off, and he watches the rest of his squadron. 
Soryu took three hits, and within minutes, it's just a conflagration. She was on fire from stem to stern. The eyewitness said looked like a blowtorch from both ends. And going back to Kaga, yes, you know, over 20 SBDs fell on her, five recorded hits, and she starts just blowing herself apart. And uh, so all within minutes, these three ships are horrors to combat. But uh, their Admiral, Admiral Yamaguchi, just said, go, launch. He wasn't asking for permission, just go. And so all he had ready were dive bombers. And within minutes, the dive bombers were off. And, uh, and so they headed to the east, and they found Yorktown. And uh, the, the Yorktown's cap was ready for them, but they couldn't knock down all of them. And uh, Yorktown suffered three hits. One was in uh, her uptakes, and that snuffed out her boilers. So she's dead in the water, and there's a, there's a famous picture of, you know, this black smoke coming out of, out of Yorktown's island uh, from that damage. Uh, took some hits on the flight deck that were quickly repaired. And within an hour or so, Yorktown was able to repair that damage and raise steam and started moving away. However, at uh, um, here you still had their torpedo bombers left. So uh, Lieutenant Tomonaga, who led the morning strike, he gets in his plane that had been damaged. So only with a half a bag of gas, he leads his torpedo bombers and they come across an American carrier, Yorktown, because they thought that you know one carrier sunk, so this is a fresh carrier, and they attack it. Uh, Yorktown was ready for it and and knocked down all but two of the torpedo bombers, that, uh, and they they were able to uh, put torpedoes. I, I should say knock down all but two, but but two got through right at the end. The last two to attack, they put two fish into Yorktown's port side, takes a severe list, and now Yorktown is abandoned. Um, and this is where Admiral Fletcher. Uh, you know, famously said to Admiral Spruance, "Will conform to your movements." So he, he, you know, he passes Spruance the lead, and uh, uh, Fletcher's planes had relayed to Spruance. Okay, here's where the fourth carrier is. Hear you. And late that afternoon, Fletcher uh, Spruance was able to launch a strike from Enterprise and Hornet uh, with, with several Yorktown orphans that just landed on on those American decks. They put five bombs into Hear You. And, and she burned until a terrible explosion around midnight, and then she was abandoned. She floated the next morning before she finally sank. Yorktown floated uh, throughout the 5th, and so uh, a fleet tug was sent to, to bring her back to Pearl Harbor. Uh, on the afternoon of the June 6th, the destroyer Hammond was alongside Yorktown providing power, and they're, they're trying to correct the list, and, and they got to be able to save it. But a Japanese submarine I-58 got in the American screen, and put uh, torpedoes into Hammond, broke her in half. She sank within five minutes, heavy loss of life, and a torpedo into Yorktown at the turn of the bilge. And Yorktown, uh, this torpedo doomed Yorktown. And uh, she floated through the night, amazingly. But on the morning of the 7th, she rolled over on her port side and fell 18,000 feet to the bottom where she sits today, sitting upright and largely intact. Your book the silver waterfall gives life as all good historical fiction does to this battle i especially like the epilogue and let me ask you to read that as the final thought here for the remainder of 1942 the two bloody navies escalated their deadly war of attrition in the south pacific with japan offering battle with her carriers two months later as if midway were little more than a setback tenacious and then suicidal Japan resisted for three more years in the face of overwhelming and finally mind-boggling firepower until Emperor Hirohito commanded the Japanese military and society to surrender and cooperate with allies. Today, Midway Atoll is administered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Close to the public, a modest memorial to the battle exists on Sand Island. Even more inaccessible, the desolate waters to the north and west of Midway, above the dark resting places of seven ships, rule eternal. Only lines on a chart and accounts passed down through the generations commemorate what happened there. So, Hoser, my friend, thank you very much for spending the time with us and bringing your expertise to bear. Well, it's great to be with you, uh, a fellow aviator, on uh, on this occasion. And and uh, yes, it is a, a battle that uh, uh, Navy, Marine Corps team, and uh, and and the United States Army Air Forces uh, uh, also participated. It was a great joint victory and, and should be remembered and honored.